Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Paul Grigsby from the Department of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Warwick. I'm a research fellow in Outreach and Impact and I'm currently engaged in a project on Roman Coventry in Warwickshire, which I developed here at home during lockdown. The aim of the project is to interest local school children in their own region, especially those school children who were traditionally excluded from studying classics. So I want to interest them in the ancient history and prehistory beneath their feet. Central to the project is the idea of Coventry as a meeting place of many cultures since before Roman times, and this fits in well with this month's Resonates Festival theme of Coventry in the world. What I want to talk about today is the evidence, albeit sometimes at a distance as you will see, for Britain and Coventry especially as a place of continual cultural change and diversity, where we're all immigrants and our history is one of continual cultural adaptation and change through the acceptance of new cultures and traditions. So it's Coventry as a cultural melting pot since prehistoric times, Coventry in the world, as well as the world in Coventry. The earliest human fossils in Britain date around 500,000 years ago, and these are a species known as Homo heidelbergensis, and this is the famous Boxgrove man in Sussex. But Coventry's history begins at exactly the same time, with five hand axes found at Waverley Wood near Coventry, and these are the oldest stone tools ever found in the UK. We think these represent a temporary hunting camp made by a small group of these early humans. So right here, 500,000 years ago, groups of Homo heidelbergensis were roving around in a tropical climate, hunting straight tusked elephants. And we found evidence for these elephants, um, again near Coventry, at a place called Wrighton Pools. Modern humans, Homo sapiens, arrived about 40,000 years ago, and then they came and went with the Ice Ages, because uh, Britain was temporarily um, uninhabitable during the Ice Ages. And then until about 11,700 years ago, after which time um, Homo sapiens stayed put. Culture of farming arrived in Britain about 6,000 years ago, so around 4,000 BC, marking the beginning of the Neolithic period. And this was a huge shift in the cultural life of the, of the region. But it seems to have been spread not by new people coming in, but the arrival of new information and technology. And around 4,500 years ago, new bell-shaped pottery like this appeared in Spain and Portugal and quickly spread across Europe again by diffusion of ideas rather than by the spread of people. This here is what we call a bell beaker, and it was found near Coventry and can be seen at the Herbert Gallery. Evidence for these beakers first appear in Britain around 2500 BC, and DNA analysis shows that the culture that brought these be beakers and the Bronze Age with them was, unlike in the rest of Europe, connected to the migration of people that completely replaced or almost completely replaced the island's earlier inhabitants and these immigrants held from the Eurasian steppes. Excavations here at the University of Warwick prior to the construction of Cryfield Sports Pavilion uncovered evidence of a six metre diameter Bronze Age roundhouse and an associated rubbish tip with the remains of a pregnant cow and a butchered fox. Further excavations under what is now University House and sort of as far as a multi-storey car park beside um, the WMG building uncovered evidence for the next phase um, with 15 Iron Age roundhouses discovered, the settlement being defended by a substantial ditch and a rampart which you can still see opposite the entrance to the Westwood Games Hall. And in fact you can see all these sites and take in um, all of these archaeological sites on campus as part of a virtual archaeological campus tour that you can see online and here's a link to it here. Now this Iron Age settlement is the earliest evidence of settlement within the modern boundary of Coventry. The Iron Age itself was inaugurated about 750 BC in Britain by the arrival of new technology, again, rather than new people. So our Bronze Age Coventry locals were integrating these new developments from Europe to become Iron Ages, and then they maintained these European links as the culture developed, borrowing what we call the, the Celtic Latin culture. This is sort of characterised by the sort of animal and swirly patterns that you kind of associate with um, Celtic art. We borrowed these from the Euro our European peers. In the same way, by the time the Romans had captured Gaul in the mid-first century BC, the Iron Age people of the West Midlands were already becoming familiar with Roman culture. Roman culture became linked to prestige, and this may have been one of the reasons why the Iron Age people of the Midlands, the Coriol Tauvi and the Dabuni, acquiesced without much struggle um, against Roman rule after AD 43. So far we know that the settlements in Roman Warwickshire, which cling mostly to the Roman road we call the False Way, were mostly small villas and farms, although there were bigger settlements at Tripontium, modern rugby, at Mansetta, just outside Nuneaton, 
and with settlements also at Princethorpe, just outside Coventry, and at Chesterton. If you drive from Leamington down the Foss Way towards Stow, then just before you hit the M40, you go over this sort of little lump, um, and that's the remains of Chesterton Roman, um, Roman town. We know of a few Roman farms and possibly villas around Coventry itself, but the most impressive site is, of course, Lunt Roman Fort, which was excavated and reconstructed with the help of um, Warwick University in the 1970s. Finds here indicate it was built somewhere around AD 60 and was therefore probably linked to Boudicca's revolt, which occurred at the same time. But exactly how they were linked, we don't know. The finds excavated at Lunt Fort are housed in the Lunt Structed Granary, and they reveal links of this proto-commentary with the wider world, of commentary in the world. Samian ware pottery was made in Gaul, there's evidence of that there. We have the top of an amphora about this big, which used to contain oil or wine perhaps, and was made in Rhodes. There's melon beads, which the soldiers had almost as dog tags perhaps, and were made from Egyptian faience, and could have been made actually across anywhere across the empire. But it's the inhabitants of the fort that are of most interest. The Lunt is singularly devoid, unfortunately, of inscriptions, but the legionaries and centurions must have been from one or more of a few legions in Roman Britain at that time. Too small to house an entire legion, it may have housed a cohort or two, or perhaps smaller units made up of a number of legions. We just don't know. If you've visited the Lunt, you'll see that there are replica shields and a standard display of the XX of the 20th Legion, the so-called Valeria Victrix. When I asked the resident Roman Rufus why the XX had been chosen, he said there was actually no real evidence for it. But the 20th was likely to, as any to have manned the fort. As I was doing my research for the project, I was looking at this ring on display at the Lunt and wondered if it did, in fact, give evidence of the 20th Legion here at the Lunt. The title of the legion, Valeria Victrix, may have been given for its role in the defeat of Boudicca, so I wondered if the palm leaf, the symbol of victory, and the XX either side were signs that this had been a ring of a soldier of the 20th, man of the Lunt. There are many questions, such as the timing of the awarding of the title Valeria Victrix, and if this ring really does show what I want it to show. But whatever legion was here at the Lunt, we can be sure that the men who manned the Lunt on and off for three centuries during its fragmentary occupation would have been of a very, very diverse background. And we can use the evidence that we know from the 20th Legion to demonstrate this. The Legion was founded in around 31 BC by the Emperor Augustus, and its first assignment was in Spain, where it took part in Augustus' campaigns against the Cantabrians. In around 20 BC, they were sent to Illyricum in Illyria, with some subunits sent to Burnham in modern Croatia. In 86, the future emperor Tiberius led at least eight legions, including the 20th, against King Maribodus in Bohemia, modern Czech Republic, after which they then moved to Cologne and then to Neuss in Germany around AD 35. No doubt adding new recruits at every stage of this adventure. In AD 43, the 20th were part of Claudius' invasion of Britain, along with two other legions, and then they were garrisoned at Camulodunum, modern Colchester. They then took part in the defeat of Caractacus, over sort of towards Wales and moved to Glevum, which is a um, modern Gloucester in about 8 AD 48. But here things become really patchy and unclear. The pattern of occupation of forts is not really well known. We know that around AD 60 some were in Gloucester, but also some were up in North Wales with Suetonius Paulinus, up at Mona, up in Anglesey, fighting perhaps the locals and the Druids. <clears throat> So when Boudicca revolted in around AD 60, the various pieces of these legion may well have moved in the sort of pincer movement um, to trap her as she came up Watling Street. And the probability is that they caught her somewhere up on Watling Street, perhaps near where the Foss Way um, joins it. So sort of X marks a spot, and that's pretty near Coventry in the Lunt Roman Fort. This might then corroborate the suggestion that the Lunt, with its unique gyrus, perhaps for horse breaking or training, was set up to deal with the horses taken at the Battle of Watling Street, where Boudicca was defeated. Continuing with the theme of commentary in the world, whether the men of the fort were from the 20th or some other legion, or even a mixture of legions, their origin would have been pretty wide and diverse. They were in no way just a bunch of Italians. They would have brought elements of their varied beliefs and cultures with them, creating unique forms just as the Romans and British gods and goddesses became fused and amalgamated. We know from tombstones of centurions and legionaries of the 20th that they hailed from all over the empire. We know of a centurion of the 20th named Marcus Porcius Lazuctan, who came from Galia in Libya. Legionaries are known from northern Italy, Gaul, Spain, Austria, Germany, Greece. 
We know of an African legionary from Ia in Libya and one Macrinus whose inscription inc included graffiti in the Punic script, the script of Carthage, so again probably another North African. Men joined up or were drafted wherever the legions went, and although the evidence is slim, we know of Britons who were drafted and ended up far away from Britain. We have an example of one Tiberius Flavius Veridus, who during the second half of the 2nd century AD and the first few years of the 3rd century AD served in three different legions, including the 20th in Britain, another in Africa, and one final legion in Italy in a career spanning 45 years. And he had a British wife called Lollia Bodica, who buried him in Algeria aged 70. Now Lollia's surname Bodica may be linked to Boudica, but his meaning victory or victorious may also be a nod to the, Vict um, to the Valeria Victrix, the 20th legion. So returning finally to commentary, whoever was at Lund after AD 60, there would have been men from all over the empire bringing their own unique mixture of cultures and beliefs. And local men from around the Lund may well have been conscripted and ended up far away in the, in the wider world, taking the culture of proto-coventry with them. As I said at the start, the evidence as yet is oblique as concerns, as concerns Coventry, but I hope at least to have shown that this has been a place of new arrivals, of the integration of new cultures and ideas, even back into prehistoric times. And surely the evidence is just waiting to be discovered under our very feet for more visitors and arrivals and diverse cultural interactions for the Roman period here in Coventry. Thank you.